Vaginitis is one of the more common gynecologic disorders you'll see in practice. It's estimated that there are 10 million office visits each year and 7% of visits made to gynecologists for this diagnosis. A surprising 1% of all antibiotics prescribed on an ambulatory basis are prescribed for women with this diagnosis. Although shotgun therapy based on an eyeball diagnosis was a very common practice in the past, Modern management of vaginitis demands that a specific diagnosis be made. My task during this presentation is to transform all of you into Inspector Clue cells, if you will, and to provide you the diagnostic tools for solving even the most vexing case of vaginitis. A common misconception shared by many clinicians is that a vaginal discharge is synonymous with a vaginal infection. The fallacy of this is well illustrated by the extensive differential diagnoses you need to consider when you see that patient presenting with a vaginal discharge. The big three, infectious vaginitis accounts for 60%, cervicitis for 20%, and 10% of the time the patient may have a normal discharge. Less common causes, atrophic vaginitis, psychosomatic vaginitis, iatrogenic vaginitis, as well as a host of miscellaneous causes. So how do you make a stab at the diagnoses? You begin with a careful history. Historical items useful in the evaluation of the patient presenting with the vaginal discharge includes the age of the patient, her menstrual status, characteristics of the discharge, including its onset, color, consist consistency, and viscosity, as well as any associated symptoms. Does it itch? Does it burn? Does it have an odor? Is there dysuria or dyspareunia? Following taking the history, you do a, a past medical history. You inquire about a history of diabetes, any recent infections, the use of medications such as antibiotics or, let's say, corticosteroids, as well as the patient's method of contraception. A woman who uses the intrauterine device is felt to be at higher risk for bacterial vaginosis. Conversely, a woman on con the combined birth control pill is at reduced risk for bacterial vaginosis, but may be at higher risk for candida. In addition, a sexual history should be obtained, as well as inquiry made regarding the patient's hygienic practices. A woman who douches is at higher risk for bacterial vaginosis. Following that, you do your physical examination, particularly a careful gynecologic exam. In addition to inspecting the discharge, it's imperative that you closely examine the vulvovaginal area and the cervix as well. Now, I've taught at UCLA now more than three decades, and I can't tell you how many times I'll have a resident present a patient with a vaginal discharge to me, and they're able to give very detailed descriptions of the discharge. And then you look at them and you say, well, what did the cervix look like? And you know, and they draw a blank. I think this underscores how often we may look at something and not see it unless you're looking specifically for that thing. And so the take home lesson here is that if the patient comes in, let's say, complaining of chest pains, you, not, you have to make sure you see arrows through the chest. But if the patient's complaining of a vaginal discharge, you gotta look at the cervix. Otherwise, you will miss this. If you focus your attention just on the discharge, you may overlook the fact that you see pus coming out of the cervical os. This is obviously mucopurulent cervicitis. Although the history and examination may suggest the diagnosis for you, they generally lack the accuracy to allow you to consistently make the correct diagnosis. So the laboratory has to play an important diagnostic role. The vaginal pull wet mount represents the cornerstone of the diagnostic evaluation of that patient presenting with a vaginal discharge. To perform this test, you do two slide preparations. You mix a few drops of the discharge with a few drops of normal saline. On a second slide, a few drops of the discharge with a 10% KOH preparation. You put a cover slip on it and you examine it under both low and high power objectives.
The WIF test, test or the SNF test is a very rapidly performed test that should be routinely done unless you're anosmic. To perform this test, you simply note the odor produced when you add the 10% KOH to the discharge. If you smell a fishy amine-like odor, that's a positive whiff test, and is seen in three-fourths of patients with bacterial vaginosis. Determination of the vaginal pH is an extremely important adjunct to the vaginal pull wet mount. In the menstruating female, the normal pH is slightly acidic, between 3.5 and 4.5. The Q-tip test, or cotton swab test, is a very rapidly performed test that can be used to confirm your suspicion that cervicitis is present. To perform this test, you get a large cotton swab, you wipe the ectocervix clean, you put a Q-tip into the endocervical canal, and you twirl it. If you see yellow mucopus on that Q-tip, you've got a positive Q-tip test, and you've confirmed your diagnosis of mucopurulent cervicitis. Now, is this a sensitive test for chlamydia or gonorrhea? The answer is no. The sensitivity is about 10%. So if you're screening for chlamydia, or if you suspect chlamydia, you're trying to diagnose it, in that circumstance, you need to do a culture or one of the nucleic acid tests that Dr. Johnson spoke about. What about vaginal cultures? Well, we use them, I think, on a selective basis. If you've got a patient who you suspect has trigomonas and your wet mount is negative, you can inoculate the discharge on one of the media seen here to confirm your diagnosis of trigomonas. If you've got a patient who's got suspected candida vaginitis and your KOH prep is negative, you can culture on either Sabarot's media or Nickerson's media. Now this is, this is an ARS session, so you have to get those pads out now because we will be using the pads. So we're gonna do some cases. Case number one, this is a 17-year-old female high school student who presents with a one-day history of an increase in her vaginal discharge. She describes it as being slightly sticky and cloudy, and she says it's associated with soreness. She denies, she says it does not itch, it does not burn, nor is there an odor. You do a microscopic examination of the saline prep, and you see this. And you know, as you're looking at these different epithelial cells, your attention is drawn to the one on the bottom. And you note that it's got that sort of glittery appearance. But while you're looking at the epithelial cells, you see this UFO here. Move its way before the, on the slide. You do a whiff test. The whiff test is negative. You do a vaginal pH, and it's alkaline. It's 6.0. What is your diagnosis? Is it bacterial vaginosis, candida vaginitis? You're a little bit slow there, Nehemiah. Trichomonas vaginitis. It's an abnormal discharge, or it's, or it's normal. Well, 15% of you said it was bacterial vaginosis, 4% said candida, half of you thought that was trigomonas, 5% uh, of you said it was abnormal, but it's not one of the first three, and I guess 30% said normal discharge. The correct answer, yeah, that, that was a normal discharge. Since up to 10% of your patients presenting with a vaginal discharge Ashley will have a normal discharge. It's important for you to recognize what constitutes a normal vaginal physiologic discharge. A normal discharge is composed of vaginal squamous cells suspended in a fluid medium derived from a transudative process that occurs across the vaginal wall. A normal discharge is clear to slightly cloudy in color, as it was in our patient. It's non-homogeneous and it's highly viscous or sticky. A normal vaginal discharge should not itch, it should not burn, nor there should there be an odor. So if the patient says to you, it doesn't itch, it doesn't burn, and there's no odor, immediately in your mind, you, you need to say to yourself, well, maybe we're dealing with a normal discharge. It's important to recognize and to tell your patients that an increased volume of discharge, which a lot of patients will interpret as being vaginitis, is typically seen at the time of ovulation, after intercourse, following menstruation, as well as during pregnancy. What about that epithelial cell? 
Well, this slide shows you a normal vaginal epithelial cells. Now, my residents will sometimes say this looks sort of glittery, and I go, well, maybe it does, but draw your attention to the cellular border. And if the cellular border is very distinctive, if it's almost linear, that's going to be a normal vaginal epithelial cell. You compare that to a clue cell. Now, this clearly looks glittery, but I draw, draw your attention to the cellular border. If it's indistinctive, if it looks sort of moth-eaten, that's a, that's a clue cell. Now, in our particular patient, granted, this does look glittery, but look at the cellular border. Very linear, very distinctive. That's a normal vaginal epithelial cell. What about the UFO? Well, you know, not all that moves under a microscope is trigomonas. That's sperm. You should be able to identify sperm fairly readily. You know, a sperm cell body, as you see here, is maybe about a third, a one-fourth of the volume or the size of a white cell. And I think we all have a good idea of what the cell body of a white cell looks like. In addition, it's got that sort of acrosomal tip at the, at, at the top of its head. It's got a longer tail, and it moves in a much more linear fashion. Compare that to a trigomonad, which is about the size of a white cell. This is actually a white cell here and here. This is, the, this is that pear-shaped organism we know as trigomonas. Obviously, they move in a very sort of herky-jerky motion as opposed to a linear motion, which is more typical for, for sperm. What about that vaginal pH? Well, a normal vaginal pH, as I said before, is slightly acidic as a result of the production of lactic acid by the lactobacillus. It should be between 3.5 to 4.5. A, a pH of above 4.5 is alkaline. It's abnormal. It's seen in almost all your patients with bacterial vaginosis and 60% of your patients with trigomonas. Okay? But this test is invalidated if your vaginal specimen is contaminated by semen, as it was in our particular patient, blood, douche preparations, as well as cervical secretions, okay? So when you obtain your specimen for a vaginal pH, it's very important that you obtain it from the mid-portion of the lateral fornix. You want to stay away from the pulling of secretions in the posterior vault because you're trying to avoid contamination with these things that would cause a false positive test. Case number two. This is a 28-year-old female graduate student who is seen for a five-day history of a thin, grayish-white discharge associated with, a, with vaginal burning and a fishy odor. When you begin your pelvic exam, you see this at the androidus. So you see this sort of milky discharge, huh, on the vaginal wall, outside the vaginal wall. You do a quick scan of the saline prep under low power, and you see this. And as you're looking at these epithelial cells, you see a cluster of cells surrounding the cells. So being, being curious, you, do a, you look, that, look at it under high power, and you see that these things are white cells. So the cluster of cells around the epithelial cells are white cells. You turn your attention back to the epithelial cell, and you see this. Her WIF test is positive. Her vaginal pH is 5.5. It's alkaline. What is the diagnosis? Does the patient have bacterial vaginosis? Does she have candida? Does she have trigomonas? Does she have a mixed infection? Or is this a normal discharge as well? Or 80% said bacterial vaginosis, and I guess the next one, I guess, would be 9% said mixed infection. The correct answer is it's mixed infection. This patient clearly has bacterial vaginosis, no if, ands, or buts. She not only has three, she has all four of the AMCEL criteria required to make the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. She's got that thin, sort of milky, homogeneous discharge. She's got the alkaline pH. She has the positive whiff test. And anybody did not recognize this as a clue cell, okay, you go to the back of the class. <laughs>
All right, so she's got bacterial vaginosis. So why a mixed infection? It was the increased number of white cells. An increased number of white cells is defined as more than 10 white cells per high power filled. If you, you're not so quite quantitatively inclined, simply demand that you see more white cells than epithelial cells in the field that you're examining. So this slide shows you this woman's uh, uh, wet mount under low power. You see the epithelial cells here. Clearly the cluster of cells, these cells here, outnumber the epithelial cells. This is an increased number of white cells. If you want, if you want to count under high power, clearly the, the number exceeds 10. An increased number of white cells is consistent with an inflammatory process. It's an inflammatory process, and it should immediately arouse suspicion of either cervicitis or trigomonas. This is the patient that you will do cervical studies for gonorrhea and chlamydia, and you do want to look at that patient very closely for trigomonas. A variable number of white cells is seen in patients with candida, and actually a reduced number of white cells is seen in patients with bacterial vaginosis. You know that disturbance in the vaginal ecosystem in bacterial vaginosis actually sends out cytokines that inhibit the migration of white cells. So you will typically see a reduced number of white cells in a patient who's got pure bacterial vaginosis. So if you see an increased number of white cells in a patient in whom you've diagnosed bacterial vaginosis, and yet she has an increased number of white cells, you have to look for a concomitant infection. Your job is not over yet. So how do you treat trigger, uh, bacterial vaginosis? Well, you know, metronidazole, the old standby, is still regarded as the drug of choice or, or first-line therapy. The first regimen that was proposed back in 1978, 500 milligram BID, most of us still regard as the gold standard. You've got alternative therapies, right? You have oral clindamycin, which some people like to use during pregnancy if you're treating bacterial vaginosis. You've got a host of topical regimens listed for you here. I think all of you are familiar with those. Now, although these topical agents are just as good as oral metronidazole, for treating bacterial vaginosis, if you evaluate the patient one week after the completion of therapy, as you can see in this CDC analysis that was published in 2002, if you look at those same patients four weeks after the completion of therapy, note the higher relapse rates four weeks afterwards. And that's why most of us still consider this the gold standard. You have an alternative to metronidazole among the nitroimidazole groups, and that's tinidazole, which is a second-generation nitroimidazole agent. It was approved by FDA for the treatment of BV, or bacterial vaginosis, in 2007, and you can prescribe it as either a two- or five-day regimen. Should you treat the male partner? The evidence says no. As you can see here, there's been a number of studies that looked at whether or not it was beneficial to treat the male partner, and six of the seven said no. The only study that showed any benefit whatsoever, that benefit was there two weeks after treating the male partner, but by six weeks after treating the male partner, the beneficial effect disappeared. So the answer is there's no benefit in treating the male partner. Now, despite your best efforts, there will be a significant number of patients that will come back with recurrent bacterial vaginosis. It's supposed to be like 20% of patients. 20, 30% of patients will be back because the bacterial vaginosis returns. Now, how do you treat those patients? I can sort of tell you there is no standard of care for that. It's really a very challenging sort of problem still. But if you go to the literature, probably the most effective therapy you'll find was, was, was published by Sobel and Associates in 2006. This was a prospective randomized controlled trial of 112 women with recurrent bacterial vaginosis. What, what Dr. Sobel did was he treated, both, he treated that group of patients with a 10-day course of metronidazole gel and then broke them up into two treatment groups. One was placebo. The other group, they gave metronidazole gel twice a week. He treated, them for 12, he treated them for 16 weeks, and then 12 weeks after treatment, he looked at them after discontinuing the, the, uh, the metronidazole gel in the treatment group. And what he found was that there was a 60% reduction of recurrences in the patients that you treated with twice a week metronidazole gel. 
But note that 12, 12 weeks after the completion of treatment, the efficacy dropped almost 50%. There was only a 30% benefit. What was the most common adverse effect seen in patients given uh, metronidazole gel during that 12-week, 16-week uh, period of time? A higher risk of candida vaginitis. This is case number three. This is a 34-year-old female who is seen by you for a one-week history of itchy, white, curd-like discharge. She notes that one week prior, she was treated for a urinary tract infection with Cipro. This is what it looks like in her vaginal vault. You sort of see this sort of cottage cheese type appearance or discharge. And under the KOH prep, you see this. So this is pseudohyphae. So we've made our diagnosis here, right, of candida vaginitis. How do you treat it? Well, I think all of you are familiar with the agents that we see here. A lot of them are over the counter. You've got single-day regimens, three-day regimens, and seven-day regimens. The only thing I can sort of say to you is that if the patient has a mild case of candida vaginitis, by all means, one-day or three-day regimens are more than effective. But if the patient has moderate to severe candida vaginitis, the efficacy of the seven-day regimen is probably what you're going to end up wanting to use because it, it, it is more effective in patients with more severe candida. You've got alternative agents that you see here. You've got Nystatin, which is an old agent that's made a sort of a comeback in the past year or two. You've got triazole antifungal agents, such as terconazole, which is given vaginally as either a three or seven day regimen. And we've got the one oral agent, right, that we use for candida vaginitis called Diflucan. Once again, if the patient has a mild infection, a single dose of 150 milligram is more than enough. But if the patient's got a severe infection, you should repeat that dose, that 150 milligram dose after 72 hours. Despite your best efforts, 10% of patients with candida vaginitis will have problems with what we call recurrent candida, the f candida infection. So the first step in those patients is to identify any predisposing factors, and they're listed for you here. Poorly controlled or undiagnosed diabetes, chronic antibiotic use, the use of certain medications such as corticosteroids, candida in the male partner, or HIV infection. Now, if this search is not fruitful, and usually it's not, the next thing I would recommend, do a yeast culture or a fungal culture, and it's for two reasons. One, you want to confirm that you're dealing with candida albicans. Two, even more importantly, you want to know whether or not there's the presence of a non-candida albicans species in causing the patient's symptoms because the non-candida albicans species are notorious for their resistance to the agents that we commonly use to treat candida vaginitis. If the patient's culture grows back candida albicans, the CDC offered you these guidelines as to how to manage recurrent candida albicans vaginitis. They recommend that you give an extended course of therapy initially in, a, in the hopes of eradicating or really knocking down the, the, the infection. So they would say using topical therapy, you treat for 14 days. If you use diflucan or fluconazole, you don't give one dose or two doses. You actually give three doses separated by 72 hours. Following that, you put them on a maintenance regimen for six months. They can use fluconazole at a dose of 100 to 150 milligram once a week. If the patient doesn't want to use an oral agent, you can prescribe one of the topical regimens listed below. This is case number four. This is a 44-year-old nurse who is seen by you for a two-month history of recurrent yeast infections. She reports that despite treatment with several over-the-counter preparations, as well as some prescription drugs that her doctor gave her, her infections continue to recur. You do a KOH prep and you see this. Now, what you're looking at here is that I don't think any of us see pseudohyphae here, but if you look real closely, you see these sort of budding spores there in this area here. You see a two over here. So all you see is budding spores. You do not see pseudohyphae. What is the cause of this woman's discharge? Does she have candida albicans? Does she have candida tropicalis? Does she have candida glabrata, 
Does she have blastomyces dermatitidis, or does she have Toriolopsis sporium as the cause of her recurrent infections? Get ready, cause I've had enough. I see it all, I see it now. I got the eye of the tiger, the fire. Okay, so 60% of you said Candida glabrata, which is the good answer, is the correct answer. 10% said Toriolopsis sporium, and that's interesting because I made that one up. <laughs> the key message here, the key message here is that if you have a patient who's got signs and symptoms of candida vaginitis, and yet when you do your KOH prep, you only see budding spores you see no pseudohyphae. This should immediately tell you you're dealing with an infection with one of the two organisms here. Candida clabrata, which is by far number one, or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You know, Candida albicans can be in the vagina and it can be normal, okay? When it causes an infection, it forms pseudohyphae. If you just see budding spores and that's Candida albicans, it's still just colonizing, okay? As I said, these non-candida albicans species are important for you to recognize because they're, they tend to be very resistant to the stuff we normally use to treat candida vaginitis. If you're going to use a topical imidazole agent, okay, you're going to treat, I, I treat for 14 days. Not one, not three, not seven. I treat for 14 days. What is the efficacy here? It's about 40%. You could use topical nystatin or mycostatin. That's actually a little bit better. If you treat those patients for 14 days, the efficacy is about maybe 50%. But clearly, the most effective agent you can prescribe is boric acid vaginal capsules. You need to tell your pharmacist to put 600 milligrams of boric acid in a size zero gelatin capsule. The patient inserts it intravaginally daily for usually seven to 14 days. The efficacy here? probably about 80%. So if you were to refer that patient to one of the specialty clinics, this is the drug that they would use. Case number five, you've got a 28-year-old housewife who is seen by you for a one-week history of a frothy, green, malodorous vaginal discharge. She complains of dyspareunia and vaginal irritation. Her vaginal pH is alkaline, it's 6.5, and the WIF test is positive. Examination of the cervix reveals this. So you see this sort of greenish, discolored, frothy discharge covering the cervix here. So you get a Q-tip, a large Q-tip, and you wipe it clean, and this is what you see. What is the diagnosis? Is this herpes that Dr. Johnson was talking about? Is this trigomonas? Is this mycoplasma genitalium? Is this bacterial vaginosis or is this chlamydia? There ain't a reason you and me should be alone tonight, yeah, baby, tonight, yeah, baby. But I got a reason that you who should take me home tonight. 73% of you said it was trigomonas, and that is the correct answer. Take a good look at this. This is the strawberry th cervix. This is the famous strawberry cervix, which is pathognomonic for trigomonas. But you know what? It's seen in less than 1% of cases. So therefore, this is probably the only time you're ever going to see this. <laughs> but this is the classic strawberry cervix, which is trigomonas. More often than not, like I said before, you're going to diagnose it on the vaginal pull wet mount by finding Motile trigomonads, which is seen in up to 70% of cases. As we saw before, they're pear-shaped, they're larger than a white cell, and they, they, they sort of move like a drunken sailor. It's a very herky-jerky sort of motion. The importance of using fresh saline and examining it as soon as you make the preparation is underscored by the fact that when these organisms die or become inactive, guess what? They look just like a white cell. They look exactly like a white cell. So I took this photomicrograph at UCLA, 
And this, is, this was moving around, I can tell you that, and you know, this one was moving as well. But this thing over here, which looks like a white cell, if this was real time, the next second this thing changed shapes and started moving across the screen. So the key element here is this. When, you've got a, when, you, when you diagnose trigomonas, usually there's going to be a lot of cellular elements on the slide. You need to go to a feathery edge of that slide. You want to have a lot of room for these things to move if they want to move. And if you go to the feathery edge and you see this, it doesn't mean you forgot to take your Haldol that morning. <laughs> it means you've made your diagnosis of trigomonas. So, like I said, you're going to make your diagnosis usually on the wet mount. If, let's say, you've got a patient who's got suspected, sus suspected trigomonas and yet the wet mount is negative, you can use this rapid antigen test, which has a sensitivity of 80%, or one in the cultures. But probably the test that I think is rapidly becoming the treatment, the, the diagnostic test of choice is going to be, going to be the nucleic acid test. You have something called a FIRM-3, which is a nucleic acid test that looks for bacterial vaginosis, candida, and trigomonas. You got some PCR tests, of which I think Aptima now has FDA approval. But this is how you're going to make your diagnosis of trigomonas. How do you treat trigomonas? Well, metronidazole is the drug of choice once again, just like with bacterial vaginosis. You can prescribe it as a single-dose regimen or a seven-day regimen, with most of us preferring the single-dose regimen because it's just easier from the standpoint of compliance uh, with patients. You have an alternative to metronidazole, and that's that second-generation nitroimidazole agent, tinidazole, also known as Tindamax. It does have FDA approval, and it's given as a single dose of two grams. Its major sort of help, uh, uh, its major sort of uh, favorable effect is that it's got a lesser incidence of GI side effects than metronidazole, but it's also burdened in some way by having a much, much longer half-life. Adverse reactions that you see with metronidazole and tinidazole include nausea, vomiting, a metallic taste in the mouth, right? If you've ever had to take uh, metronidazole, that, you do taste that metallic taste. Don't forget to tell patients about the antabuse reaction. The antabuse reaction is very real with these agents. If the patient is treated with metronidazole, they need to avoid the use of alcohol not only during treatment, but for 24 hours afterwards. Because tinidazole has a longer half-life, you need to avoid alcohol for 72 hours after taking the last dose. Can you use it during pregnancy? Well, metronidazole is a category B drug, Tinidazole is category C, so therefore metronidazole is your safe drug to use during pregnancy. It is passed in breast milk, both of these two drugs. So once again, it's recommended that if the woman's breastfeeding and you treat them with one of these two agents, they, they withhold breastfeeding during the time of treatment and they avoid it for, once again, 24 hours after they stop the agent if they're using metronidazole for 72 hours after tinidazole. Trigomonas is a sexually transmitted infection, and although measures as drastic as this is not required, both the patient and the partner obviously require treatment. They should be evaluated for the presence of other STDs, and at a minimum offered counseling regarding HIV testing and the need for safer sexual practices. This is our last case now, and then we can go to lunch. This is a 42-year-old married female attorney, and she is seen by you for her annual exam. Her pap smear reveals evidence for trigomonas, sort of the story that Dr. Johansson was relating with HSV. Her husband of 10 years is also a patient of yours, and both he and the patient say adamantly there's been no instance or episodes of infidelity. What is the explanation? Is it a false positive test? Did he cheat? She cheated. Did, did they, one of them acquired it prior to marriage, and none of, neither of the two cheated. Or did someone use a public toilet? This always tells me a lot about the audience when we look at the responses here.
43% said false positive. 32% said it was required prior to marriage. 10% said he cheated. You know, <laughs> you know, there's more men in this audience than women, so that's why that number is probably relatively low. 7% said she cheated. You know, she's a lawyer. I'm amazed that that number is not higher. <laughs> and 8% sort of said they used the public, someone used a public toilet. The correct answer, all of them were possibly correct. Could it be a false positive test? And the answer is absolutely, unequivocally yes. The sensitivity of the pap smear for trigomonas is 60%. The specificity doesn't sound bad, right? It's 92% if you're using a standard pap smear, 96% if it's liquid-based. But once again, once you start to look at false positives, false negatives, you have to, you have to invoke the Bayes theorem, right? Which demands that you, you look at the, 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 the impact of this sensitivity and specificity based on the prevalence of the disorder in the, in the population you're studying. So let's say the prevalence was extremely high. Let's say this was a, let's say this was a prison clinic or a STD clinic or even some of the student health services in some of the colleges across the country. Let's say the prevalence was 20%. Even in that circumstance, one out of two is, is false positive. But let's say you look at the prevalence in probably closer to the situation that we have in, with this married couple. Let's say the prevalence was only 1%. Note that 19 and 20 is going to be false positive using the standard pap smear. And if you use the more specific liquid-based pap smear, 9 and 10 will be false positive. So therefore, if that's the case, it clearly you're going to want to do the PCR test if you're going to declare that somebody really, really cheated. So clearly, right, somebody could have cheated. It could have been the male or the female because we know that, that trigomonas is a sexually transmitted infection. What about someone, one of them acquiring it before marriage? And the answer is yes, that's possible. Trigomonas is asymptomatic in up to 50% of patients, and particularly in men. There's a dormant phase. There's truly a dormant phase in men and women. So unless you did a PCR test before they got married on both members of that couple, you cannot absolutely say that one of them did not acquire it prior to the marriage. Some people, 7%, I think, said the toilet seat. And you know, actually, there's evidence that says you may be correct that maybe the toilet seat was responsible. Because this the trigomonas has been isolated from fomites, including swimming pools, hot tubs, as well as the toilet seat. This is the toilet seat study. <laughs> this study was published by Whittington in the British Journal of Venereal Disease in 1957. Now, no one would call this a high-tech experiment, because all Whittington did was she took an inoculum that was teeming with trigomonas, she put it on a toilet seat, and she determined how long trigomonas remained viable on that toilet seat. And what she found was that trigomonas could survive for up to 45 minutes on the toilet seat. And it generally preferred the polished wood ones over the absorbent wood ones with the Bakelite seats running a close second. Now, being a good investigator, she asked the next question, right? The next question is whether or not someone who had an infection with trigomonas could actually deposit such an inoculum onto a toilet seat. So to answer this question, she rigged up a special water closet. This was a British study. She rigged up a special water closet, and she asked patients with particularly heavy infections to pass water in that water closet. Recognizing that some people sit and some people don't sit when they pass water, she also rigged up a hidden sensor device onto the toilet seat that activated a silent alarm system in an observation room nearby. The results, she found that you could deposit such an inoculum on the toilet seat in two out of 17 circumstances where the patient sat, and actually two out of 13 who did not. 60 years later, the next logical question is now being asked in a study at UCLA. It's an ongoing study. The study is whether or not someone who sits on such a toilet seat 
will actually contract the infection. My UCLA colleague, colleagues tell me that volunteer recruitment has been slow. <laughs> so if there are any volunteers in the audience, you can see me after today's talk. So in quick summary, vaginitis is a very common problem we see in practice. The key to its management is making an accurate diagnosis based on the history and exam, as well as skillful use of the law office laboratory. Once you make a specific diagnosis, effective therapy can be prescribed. Thank you for your attention. We, are now, we will now adjourn. You can go to lunch. If you have any questions, feel free to come up and see me.